All right, we are recording. And I have exactly four o'clock. So welcome everybody to the um, Friends from the Field webinar. We're gonna talk about apples today and we're very, very excited to have Edgar here. Uh, Martha will do his formal introduction in just a little bit. Um, I'm Jake from Island Heritage Trust and Martha is joining me. Friends from the Field is a collaborative webinar between Island Peninsula. Uh, today we're going to be using the chat feature, which you can see in the center middle bottom of your screen there. You can plug questions for Edgar as we go along through the presentation. Uh, we will save the question portion for the end and Martha and I will come through and Edgar's well, welcome to join as well. And we'll answer as many questions as we can with the time allotted to us before five o'clock. Um, the other feature that we like to use is the raise your hand feature. So that's at the, on my screen, it's at the bottom center right, if you will. And you can raise your hand and ask Edgar your, your question with your own audio if you choose at the end. And I'll monitor that and, and give people the option to use that feature if they'd like. And I think with that, I'll hand it over to Martha and she'll do a quick introduction for Edgar and then we can get started in learning about the beautiful fruits Thank you. Well, I certainly look forward to this program. I'd like to introduce you to Edgar Evenkeel. He lives at Stone Palm Farm in Surrey with his wife, Liz, and his dagger dog. Uh, he loves to climb trees and eat fruits. And Edgar, Edgar, Edgar earned his BS in um, plants, soils, and, sci and insect sciences from UMaine Amherst and he works as a cer certified arborist in Maine and the way. Thank you, Edgar, glad to have you here. Thank you, Martha. So today I'm in Massachusetts. I often come down here for tree work. I travel mostly around New England, but I'll go anywhere where the trees are calling me. I, at the time when we scheduled this webinar, I thought I would be in Maine and be able to show you some cool and interesting trees. I had scoped out some cool apple trees that I could use at, to do an active demonstration, but with the rain and uncertainty about if I would have cell coverage, I opted to for today's webinar. I'm gonna show you some illustrated diagrams, which I was gonna do anyways. And then if there's time or if you like, like if, I, if it makes sense that I demonstrate cuts, I. Full disclosure, I can prune this uh, autumn olive shrub that looks like a seedling crab apple tree, just so that you can see what I'm talking about when I talk about placement of the pruning shears and uh, pruning saw. But a lot of what we'll do in this webinar, I'll just be showing pictures and descriptions from literature, uh, and we'll just talk and have a open dialogue. So if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to throw them out there. Um, and I'm not getting the chat function to pop up that well. So if I could just have a little assistance, if someone wanted to chat questions, um, that would be cool. Can everyone hear me and see me okay? Edgar, I can see you great. The, um, the Brightness is balancing in and out. Yeah. Um, it's kind of fluctuating between you and the beautiful background that you have there. But I think for the purpose of this webinar, we're good. Uh, and if, if you'd like me to ask the questions as they pop up in the chat box, I'm happy to do that. Um, I, usually we, we just that. leave the, the panelists, the presenter uninterrupted, but um, it's, it's your call. Yeah, that would be really helpful. Thank you, Jacob. Great. So I'm, I'm sorry if the light of my background is bothering anybody. I can shift and turn to the side, but it will be a uh, less uh, ornamental background. Um, so to start, I'll say that uh, when, there are some really wonderful apple trees at the Island Heritage Trust, Trust property in Deer Isle. And we had a really fun pruning workshop there 
last spring or late winter. And I hope we can do something like that again, because getting a group of people together, hands on with tools and making some pruning cuts is really good. But, and it, it's so it's cool that we're going to talk about apple tree ecology today and we'll touch a little bit on pruning but it's not really home orchard pruning season right now anyways so we can just share appreciation for trees apple trees fruit trees and the benefits that they have and the natural beauty that they bring to our landscape so this is a really cool picture that i like to share a lot I hope everyone can see it. So this is a picture from a book called Understanding Roots, which is um, written by, I believe, uh, Robert Corrick. And it um, shows our, uh, kind of like archeological excavations of apple tree roots. And you can see that the above ground portion of the tree is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, in most cases, depending on what your soil is, uh, where you're growing your apple trees, the roots may not go that deep. It, it, most trees feeder roots are in the top six inches, six to eight inches of soil, and then the anchorage roots and tap root roots go deeper. But so that's to say the above ground portion of the tree that we see and love and appreciate, the trunk, the scaffold branches, the limbs, the fruit clusters, the fruit spurs, the young vegetative shoots, all of these different uh, morphological structures that make you know an apple tree what it is. Uh, they all have very important functions, but the most important part for a healthy apple tree or any type of fruit tree plant uh, is the root system. So, I always encourage everyone, if you're cultivating any kind of crops for fruit or food or ornamental value in your landscape, or if there's an old apple tree on your property that you want to renovate, a very good starting point is to take a soil sample and submit that to the UMaine Extension Soil Test Lab, and that will give you a good baseline understanding of what's going on in your tree's root zone because that's where like the I don't want I don't want to say percentage but it's in, an integral component of a healthy biological system to see what kind of macronutrients and micronutrients and minerals are available in the soil how much organic matter is present, which can be an indicator of bio, uh, microorganisms that can uh, all have a symbiotic relationship with an apple tree. And that is all happening in the dirt, in the soil, below ground, both in a residential landscape in a wild roadside ditch, out in the edge of the woods, or in a cultivated orchard. Um, so in all those different places, there's gonna be totally different soil chemistry and qualities, um, but they all ha have an influence on how productive and healthy and long lived the tree will be. And also, the tree, the tree's resistance to insect and disease pests. So that's why I like to call this talk the ecology of apple trees, um, because there's so many different topics and components of what makes an apple tree an apple tree. Um, and some of it is, a lot of it is invisible to our I, when we walk up, we see a tree and we appreciate it. Oftentimes, you know, once you, my friend, Matt Kaminsky, who does gnarly pippins, uh, his website, he's a wild and seedling fruit tree explorer and cider maker. And he has published a book about um, foraging for wild apples and selecting certain varieties that may have qualities that you would look for in fresh eating for the fruit 
baking for the pies or pressing juice for cider. And Matt and I have both been very much influenced by John Bunker from Fedco Trees and Super Chili Farm, who uh, Martha told me he's going to be giving a very good talk in the upcoming days. So, and John is always gives very entertaining uh, presentations in the world of apples, her heritage varieties, and uh, that are local and special around Maine. Um, yeah, so I just saw in the chat, someone asked about a reference to the book. So I have a lot of literature that I'm gonna be sharing. So the first picture that I showed was that um, root, root book. Uh, so this is a great book I would recommend just for everyone who is interested in understanding trees and root systems. So very valuable and interesting reading, uh, Understanding Roots by Robert Couric. I got turned on to that book because there are um, diagrams borrowed from that book in this book, which is, I call it, a lot of us call it the apple growers Bible. So if you aren't familiar with Michael Phillips, uh, I strongly recommend that you get a copy of this book. It has great folk wisdom and uh, personal experience and positive energy uh, that has definitely helped me on my journey, journey to building a more intimate relationship with apple trees and home orcharding and growing fruit organically. Um, Michael has published two other books besides that one, but that is a great starting point for anyone who wants to know how they can take better care of the apple trees. And uh, he talks about peaches, I think, and grapevines uh, also, and definitely pear trees as well. Um, pear trees are somewhat similar to apple trees, but they have a slightly different preference uh, when it comes to what kind of soil they are willing to tolerate versus apple trees. Um, sometimes they can be more fussy, sometimes they can be more rugged. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to what type of rootstock um, the apple tree is growing on. So John Bunker has a great Fedco poster about, is it a seedling or a grafted tree? Um, and I guess just to say, for point of reference, a lot of the literature that I reference is available on the Fedco Trees website. If you look, they have a great uh, literature section and I've collected a lot of their handouts from years and years of attending the Common Ground Fair and listening to all of the experts talk in the Hayloft tent. And so that, that's a wonderful resource. Um, but getting back to when I say what kind of root stock uh, your tree is growing on, this is a good diagram that kind of shows, and if you, that shows the different sizes of a maturity that an apple tree can be depending on what type of rootstock that it's grafted onto. So in talking about rootstocks, um, so a lot of times if you find a wild apple tree that's growing out of a stone wall or a fence line or the side of the road, that's probably a seedling tree that is either, you know, someone threw an apple core out of their car window when they were driving by or a bird or a coyote or some wildlife ate a piece of fruit and then passed that uh, the seeds through their digestive system and through the miracle of nature those seeds germinated and grew and didn't get mowed down and grew into a mature tree so that's what I mean by a seedling tree now most trees that you buy or that either are grown in grown in a orchard, home orchard or a uh, for-profit orchard, or that are available for purchase from a fruit tree nursery, like 99% of those trees are grafted unless you're specifically seeking out 
seedling varieties of apple trees, which some nurseries do specialize in. Um, and it's also fun to grow apple trees out from seed and see what you will get. It's kind of like playing the lottery because there's such great genetic diversity contained in apple tree seeds. But because of that, what that means is if you grow, if you eat an apple and you collect five seeds from that apple and grow each five of those seeds into a tree, every, all five of those trees will have a different uh, phenotype. They will probably be different height. Uh, they'll probably have different colored fruit. You know, it's a one in a mil, a one in a hundred thousand chance that you're going to get a fruit that is the same as the fruit of the parent tree and that actually tastes good. Most of those fruits are just going to be spitters and they're going to be hard to, hard to swallow. Um, but there can be good, it is worthwhile to grow seedling apple trees. Um, grafting takes that variability out of the equation and it's done on an incredibly large scale. There are some fruit tree propagators in Maine who graft a lot of apple trees. Um, Seth Yentes from North Branch Farm in Monroe has a really beautiful fruit tree nursery and he uses a couple of different techniques for propagating and grafting apple trees and pear trees and fruit trees. Um, and then uh, there, well, just suffice to say that every year Mofka hosts the seed and scion exchange and teach and different kinds of varieties of apple tree scion wood is available uh, to take home or to have custom grafted. And you can try your hand at the art of grafting and produce your own apple trees from grafting. I didn't think to bring any um, books about woody plant propagation, but that's a whole um, exciting topic of conversation for another webinar is just about grafting. But I particularly am very interested in rootstocks because that really dictates the mature height, size, and spread of an apple tree. It can also influence the age at which the tree begins to start bearing fruit. It can mean the difference between a tree that will live for 20 years and a tree that will live for 150 years. And it also different types of apple tree rootstock will tolerate different soil conditions. Some may tolerate heavier clayey soils. Some might suffer under those conditions and only want to be in nice fertile loam. Uh, some can tolerate more drought conditions. Some can tolerate more flooding. And some rootstocks are susceptible to fire blight and woody apple aphid, which is a type of insect. Um, some are more re disease resistant to those common diseases that affect, uh, can have a harmful effect on apple trees. Oh yeah. I don't know that why the name Martha is flashing on the screen, but it looks like Martha is muted. She's one of the hosts for this webinar. Um, sorry. If that bothers you. This Zoom is so uh, kind of impersonal. I wish I could be talking to all of you wonderful audience people in person, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that again next year. So I was talking about roots. Root, so roots are so important. So I was recommending that you take a soil test. I also like to just dig a test hole in the ground in a couple of places when I'm doing that soil test and look for earthworms, look for grubs, beetles, mushrooms, any kind of different microorganism that could show you that would be a sign that the soil is alive. Um, a lot of times, you know, like in a lawn or um, in a certain, under certain conditions like soil, Soil can be sterile. Hey, Paul, I'm giving a webinar, but I think that uh, 
I'm comfortable here. I'll come find you and I'm done. Sorry, that was my uh, friend, Paul. Um, so life in the soil is important. And that's why I say in the ecology of apple trees, because we can promote uh, microorganisms and make a healthier ecology for these tree for trees so that they will be longer lived and more productive. Um, and one of the pictures that I have love to share, um, yes, this is one of them. So this is a picture from Mike, Michael Phillips's book. And this I think is like the best pictorial uh, representation of what I mean when I say the ecology of apple trees. And you can see there's earthworms and nematodes and ants and centipedes and spiders and all of these different uh, invertebrates and microbes that really have a symbiotic relationship with apple trees in such a way that they really couldn't live without each other to the extent that they do. Um, and um, so here, I don't know if you can see this up close, but where it says saprophytic fungi and mycorrhizal fungi, those are both microorganisms that are, occur naturally in healthy soils, but because of how heavily humans have impacted soils, oh, sorry, I'll try to hold it up better to see if you can see it better. Um, because of how aggressively we have cut trees and deforested and trampled and compacted soils, a lot of times, the full population of those microorganisms are not present in the soil. So it's kind of our task to enliven the soil by light cultivation, mulching, uh, annually applying a small amount of compost. And also um, we do a lot of biodynamic teas and herbal teas. And what I mean when I say that is these are plant-based uh, fertilizers that uh, you, can, you can make at home. We make it at our farm, uh, at, at the main heritage orchard and uh, many organic Vegetable farms and fruit farms are using this practice of being, making and applying biodynamic teas, which is kind of like a little bit, uh, it's, it's basically compost tea with other specifically chosen plants that are fermented to withdraw certain micronutrients uh, and microbes to help enliven plants. Uh, and let's see here. Uh, this book, uh, I don't know. Yeah, this book is a really good one. The Biodynamic Orchard Book. Um, and this has a good description of the biodynamic teas, but there's a lot more that you can learn about that. You don't have to stick adhere strictly to the timing or the recipes, you can just go out and pick dandelions and comfrey and nettles and horsetail and um, put them in a five gallon bucket full of water and let them sit and then stir it for a few days and stir that liquid. And that through that process, nutrients that will really promote healthy plant growth, uh, both by watering it into the tree's root zone. And also if you have any kind of sprayer, like a backpack sprayer or a tank sprayer, by spraying this herbal tea 
onto the trees, it can help bring uh, more biological activity and allow the trees to, it'll boost their immune system, make them more resistant to insects and diseases and provide nutrients that they need in order to do their, uh, the, pl the plants, um, not uh, metabolic processes, I, I would say, where they are uh, absorbing nutrients from the soil, absorbing nitrogen and oxygen or, and carbon dioxide from the air and blending these things together through the process of photosynthesis and respiration and making carbohydrates and sugars, which go from the leaves into the fruit. And I just think it's so fun to think about like how an apple or a piece of fruit growing on a tree is basically like a sugary water balloon. It's like a perf you have, they're not always perfect. I mean, some fruits are ugly, but a round, a spherical shaped uh, piece of plant tissue really that's made of, you know, these plant metabolites and nutrients. It's a lot of uh, water, like they're, is a high percentage of water in there. But the sugars, soluble sugars, is what we as p humans with a sweet tooth and animals uh, and insects and fungi are all looking for is we all want the same thing from the fruit and that's the sugar. And that can be promoted and increased. And, uh, and by sugar, I mean fructose, which is often the, and other, types of sugars and carbohydrates, but that's really the main goal of in the fruit. Now, apple trees don't really care, uh, you know, biologically speaking, whether the fruit is sweet or bright red or bright, bright yellow. Their goal, genetic programming, is to produce as meant, grow vegetatively so that they can be healthy and do sunlight and then produce as many seeds as possible and spread them far and wide for the next generation of trees. So they have evolved these ways of inviting wildlife, uh, first by inviting bees and pollinators to come to the flowers by making them a pretty white and pink color and fragrant ap apple blossom. And uh, all of those things invite many different kinds of pollinators, flies, wasps, hornets, uh, to the flowers to pollinate them. And then once the fruit is ripe, uh, to eat that fruit as a carrying agent for the seeds and spread them around so that more trees will grow. So I just think that's such a cool thing from an ecological perspective about the why and how fruit All right, sorry, I was just reading some of the chats. Um, okay, so yes, that's a good question. Uh, I love to talk about soil. So thank you for the question, Andrew. So the uh, what's the cost of getting your soil tested? I think from UMaine, it's like 20 or $30, maybe $15. It's super affordable to submit a soil sample. And if you go on their website, UMaine or Extension hat in Orono has a soil test analysis lab and you can download the test form and print it out. Uh, some local garden centers also have um, these little cardboard boxes and the test form. I know in Surrey at, um, or in Blue Hill rather at Mainscapes, they have the soil test lab form and the, and it looks like a little cardboard box that you can label it with your name in the field um but if so and then so you go out to your garden area around your tree and you want to dig down about 10 uh anywhere from 6 to 12 inches but 8 or 10 inches deep in the ground uh with a trowel a, make sure your tool is 
clean so that it's not, you don't have any potting soil or other dirt on it so that you can get a pure uh, analysis of what your soil is. But I do this for both my vegetable garden and for my fruit planting areas or, um, so it's useful information. And then you, you can mail or, or drop off um, the soil sample um, to the soil test lab in Orono and they will do the soil test analysis and it might take a couple of weeks, but then they'll mail you or email you a report that says what the macronutrients are in the soil and the micronutrients and the uh, organic matter and the uh, cation exchange capacity, which is a quality of soil that can tell you how much nutrients the soil can hold on its surface uh, in, on the particles. And that varies whether you have a sandy soil, a silty soil, or a clayey soil. Um, but the higher the cation exchange capacity, the more effective the soil is at feeding nutrients, holding on to nutrients so that they don't get leached away with rain and snow melt. And then the, avail the soil's ability to make those nutrients available to the tree's roots. Um, and yes, so when you submit the soil test form to the testing lab, they do ask you uh, what kind of crops you're testing, whether it's ornamentals or vegetable gardens or blueberries or forest trees or orchard. And if you check the orchard box, fruit orchard box, um, then they will supply you a description of what they recommend for amending your soil appropriately either to prepare for planting new trees or uh, to um, amend soil where there's like an old, a beautiful old apple tree that could use a little bit of TLC and love and boosting it um, and bringing it back to its prime health. Um, so I hope that answers everyone's question so far about soil testing. That's a, a valuable tool. Um, there are certain things that I can tell you this. Most soils are deficient in organic matter. And so just by adding, just by removing a grass, if there's grass growing right up to the trunk of the tree, that gra green grass lawn is stealing nutrients from the apple tree and it's suppressing atmospheric gas exchange. Roots need to be able to breathe. And what the uh, grass does is it holds carbon dioxide in the soil and doesn't allow oxygen to get to the tree's roots. So by removing the grass and having uh, compost and wood chip mulch, uh, that is the healthiest thing that you can do for apple trees and also uh, it doesn't have to be wood chip mulch you can do fall leaf mulch seaweed mulch uh, animal like uh, spring animal bedding um, and anything that will hold moisture in the soil and um, increase the organic matter content of the soil because that's where all of these different soil microbes want to live and hang out and party with the tree's roots. Um, so yeah, I always recommend removing grass now from a tree's root zone. Now you can have um, grass mixed with clover or wildflowers or uh, medicinal and culinary herbs growing in that root zone that will form symbiotic relationship with the tree's roots and influence its health. Um, and this is, so on the Fedco website, I know I keep saying that a lot, but they have 
a great list of companion plants for the orchard, uh, including hundreds of different kinds of herbs and flowers. Some of them are native and some of them not necessarily, but still have benefits to the soil and to the plants. And I put that sheet somewhere. We'll come back to that later. But if you look up companion plants for apple trees, there's a great list and a lot of them have beautiful flowers or um, produce uh, food that uh, greens that you can put on your salad and enjoy through the year. Um, and that is to say any anything broadleaf or biodiversity more than one species is always is going to be better than just a monoculture grass lawn when you're uh, in in the area where you're growing fruit trees. Um, okay. So a question about transplanting an apple tree. Um, you can do it with a shovel, but what I recommend is pruning the roots of the tree with a, sh a deep spade, but leaving that tree where it is for six months and then coming it back and digging it later by root pruning a tree that you want to transplant, uh, there will be less likelihood of that tree uh, suffering from transplant shock or drought stress and it will help it get established better when you plant it in its new location. Um, you can dig it with a Shop, you should root prune and then you can come back with a uh, loader or a backhoe and carefully lift it out of the ground. I've dug out trees like that uh, with um, forks on a tractor loader. Uh, as long as you're careful, the goal is to minimize damaging or severing uh, the roots as much as possible when you're transplanting. Um, and also, uh, you should soak the roots for a couple of days, like make sure that the root ball is very wet before you dig that tree out of the ground. Because uh, uh, a five foot tall tree, that's a bigger tree than you would probably want to um, do, transplant bare root. Most trees that, new trees that you'll get from a mail order catalog or nursery, uh, they're going to ship them to you bare rooted. Um, and tree and young trees that are two year two to three years old with a two inch diameter will have no problem being transplanted bare root. But once they get a little bigger and older than that, there's going to be a higher likelihood of transplant shock. And a question about a beautifully gnarled apple tree on a new property. So identifying different app varieties of apples is a unique skill i do not i have not mastered yet i'm still working on it i can recognize some varieties of apples from looking at the fruit uh, but i definitely can't tell what kind of tree it is just from looking at the leaves and branches uh there are many nice unique old heritage varieties uh, that have survived through the ages around Maine and New England and around the country. Um, the best way to identify your fruit would be to bring, bring fruit from your, take pictures of your fruit. And if you can bring fruit to the Great Maine Apple Day, which I think is in Unity in November, uh, and there are experts that present there who will be able to help you identify what kind of fruit uh, variety your tree is. Um, cool. So I haven't done any talk about pruning yet and it's 440 now. So I can talk about pruning for 15 or 20 minutes or we can open more discussion. 
what do you think, Jacob and Martha? Um, Edgar, it seems to my record, you've answered all the current questions and I think you've done a, a great job. So if you wanted to sort of open a general discussion about pruning specifically, we could talk about that for another 15 or 10 minutes. And yeah, then let's just call it 10 or 15 minutes. That sounds good. Yeah, and we don't have to end right at five. We just we just do our best to you know cool. sort of be respectful of our presenters and and our yeah. guests alike. So I think that that's a great topic to end on. Um, and everyone who's uh, tuning in, if you have any uh, questions regarding pruning for Edgar, please drop them in the chat box. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Also, if someone is interested, the USDA NRCS has published this um, excellent document uh, called um, Hand Planting Guidelines for Bare Root Trees and Shrubs. Uh, I'm not sure if that's clear, but this is a valuable document you can find online and it gives great information about the proper way, how not to plant it too deep or too shallow. And then on the back, they kind of show um, some of the different way, what can happen to a tree based on how it's planted. Uh, so I always take a lot of care with my handling, inspection and handling of the roots uh, when I'm planting or transplanting a tree. Okay, what's that say? Q and A, cool, this is fun. Okay, pruning, yes, great. And how far, so how far apart you should plant an apple tree depends on what kind of rootstock it's growing on. If you get a tree that is on Antonovka or a standard rootstock, those should be 25 to 30 feet between trees. If you get a semi, semi dwarf or semi standard tree on like M111 or M7 or Bud 118 rootstock, those should be planted like 18 feet apart. And if you get a tree on like V1 rootstock or Bud, not what is that? Bud nine rootstock, a like a highly dwarfing rootstock, those trees can be planted like five feet apart from each other, but I wouldn't recommend doing much less than that. And yes, deer droppings, any kind of wildlife droppings definitely encourage uh, healthy nutrients going into the trees. So you shouldn't need to fertilize your tree at all, or at least if you did, if your tree was had a nutrient imbalance, it shouldn't be lacking in nitrogen because that would be provided by deer droppings. So, pruning, pruning, pr let's. I'm just gonna jump into pruning. Pruning is like my favorite thing to do. I do it for work. I do it for fun. I read about it. I talk about it, and in the winter and springtime and early summer is a great time of year to do demonstrations and show people what I mean when I'm pruning. So uh, this tool, my um, hand pruners, uh, this has like a one and a half inch capacity. There's a lot of different brands of pruners. Um, and then, and some of them last more than longer than others, I guess you get what you pay for. And then a good sharp uh, hand saw. I often steer people away from using like a hacksaw because that can leave rough uh, edges around the pruning wound and the tree may not be able to heal around that. And that could be an entry point for diseases. Um, so a good fine pruning saw um, I like these silky saws, uh, but there's a lot of different brands. Uh, you can pick one up at most hardware sto stores or garden centers. Uh, a lot of folks like the old fashioned Owesco wheeler saw. Owesco is the orchard equipment supply company. 
and they make a wheeler saw which uses a band saw blade which is replaceable push or a pull a pull uh depending on what feels more comfortable for you so uh in pruning trees a lot of us so if you're planting a young tree so there's three different ages of trees young newly planted trees that haven't borne fruit yet um uh trees that in their are in the prime of their fruit bearing so that would be like five year, five to ten years old plus and then old legacy uh we uh they call the the ancients like the 100 year old trees that have survived through some summers and winters and are still alive you know and are just like beautiful and majestic and we just appreciate them uh so in pruning Good, no matter what the age of the tree, making good, clean pruning cuts is really important. And knowing a couple of things about how tree branches grow and heal can be kind of important. It's important, if possible, avoid making a stub cut or a, he a, a header cut or a topping cut. It's best practice to cut back to a viable lateral branch. And what I mean by that is, if you have a branch that's overextended, it has old tired fruiting spurs, it's good to clean those up. And my rule of thumb is not to remove any more than 30% of the total photosynthetic canopy per year. You can cut dead, dead wood, take all of the dead wood out of an apple tree of any age, uh, just remove it any time of year when you see it or whenever you get around to it. Uh, dead wood is just cluttering and taking up space and in some cases it can be a reservoir for diseases and insects um, but i like to focus on good establishment training for young trees so if you have newly planted trees that are like two or three or four years old i like to go out with like a jute twine and uh, tie down branches that uh, are growing too much upright and try to bend them down so that they have a better angle. Um, branches that grow too much upright are likely to break off under the weight of the fruit or the leaves or in a windstorm. Uh, so it's better to have wide branch angles. Um, this is another diagram from the apple grower book. Uh, so very valuable. Um, so yes, root suckers, those get pruned out. Water sprouts often get pruned out, but I, I try not to prune out every single water sprout. I like to leave like 50% of the water sprouts that are growing in the right direction because those are gonna be rejuvenation branches and those are gonna be uh, where the tree is going to bear fruit in, three, in two or three years. Uh, and it'll, those can be productive fruit bearing branches for five years, but it's important to get, uh, apple trees will be appreciate being pruned every year, every winter to get the most balanced, uh, fruit crop yield. Um, but sometimes you don't get around to it for a year. You only prune it every other year. Some folks might only be able to get around to pruning every five years but a little bit of pruning every year uh goes a long way and helps keeps the tree in balance um so i do uh establishment pruning on trees that i'm planting um or trees that i planted last year or trees that someone else has planted if i go I'm gonna first do removing only branches that are co-dominant, which is to say, if you have a single stem and it's forking off in two directions, uh, I'm gonna oftentimes pick one of those two branches and that's gonna be my central leader. 
um, if when you have two competing branches, it's more likely that that will split in the future. So it's important. That's the most important thing to try to avoid. Um, and then if I see any kind of disease or dieback, I'll always prune dead branches out of a tree. Um, but a lot of the young tree training can be done with string or a rock super glues onto a clothespin or a branch spreader just to get better lateral branch angles to uh, train that tree to have a nice wide branching and that will make stronger fruit bearing branches for the long term and also help decrease the risk of the tree getting a bad fungal or bacterial infection uh, because trees need to breathe. They uh, were pruning for increased sunlight penetration into the canopy and better airflow. So airflow can blow some uh, pest insects through the tree in a way. It can allow birds uh, to get in there and eat insects and the sunlight will help dry out the leaves, increase photosynthesis and decrease the risk of getting apple scab or uh, black rot disease uh, or fire blight to a certain extent. That's a really challenging disease to manage. I could do a whole talk just about what's up with fire blight and apple trees uh, because it can be super devastating. Um, and we're seeing, we have seen a lot of fire blight burning off branches of trees with an bacterial infection in Maine this year. Uh, and then, yeah, brown tail moth, moth also, I should say, uh, is a horrible nuisance. Uh, it can cause a rash. The brown tail moth will strip all of the leaves off of the tree. And the best way to control brown tail moth in apple trees is to prune their egg nests, egg sac nests out of the branches in the winter. Uh, different folks are using different techniques. I try to use a pole saw or pole pruner to get them out from up high. Uh, I have heard of people using a shotgun with bird shot to actually shoot the brown tail nests. I haven't tried this, but a couple of people have told me they did it and it really works. I'll tell you that I climbed through two apple trees that had brown tail caterpillars crawling in them and eating the leaves and I got the a really severe rash from them. So it is important to manage them. And in some cases it may be necessary to spray them with insecticide. There are some organic options that are effective, but that can have detrimental effects. It can hurt beneficial insects from other caterpillar species. Um, so it's better to just prune out and remove the brown tail nests in the winter when you see them. Um, and I think those are the basics of apple tree pruning, but we'll definitely be doing more pruning workshops probably in like February, March, April of 2022. That's going to be a great time to prune apple trees. Um, so yeah, I can hand it back over to you, Jacob, or if anyone has any more questions. Thanks so much, Edgar. I am going to check our... Oh, we had one submission to the Q&A section from Sandra asking if, if we could um, share the uh, documents that were listed today. So Edgar, if you, if you don't mind compiling a list, I can make sure that they get over to um, Chrissy or Beth at Blue Hill and they're included in the um, call cool. email for this webinar. <laughs> Yes, I will work on putting that together over the weekend. Great, great. And let me just see if anybody <clears throat> is raising their hands. So now I guess we have like five minutes left. So if anybody wanted to raise their hand and ask Edgar their question with their own audio, now would be the time. I do have eyes on that and am able to uh, able to set that up for anybody who would like to do it. Um, let's see. 
So Edgar, I, I had a I had a question. Um, yes. And I, I think you may have already answered this in a couple of different ways, but I guess just um, for the sake of asking, I'll do it anyways. We have a we have a super old um, pear tree in our yard, and it always falls victim to the brown tail moths. Um, and you know, we discussed you know a lot about you know insecticide and the the injection things that you can do for it. Um, and it's far, it's far enough away from the water where we decided that we would do that. And you have to wait to a certain time of year um, out of respect for the pollinators because you don't want the bees to be um, interrupted with that. So we've done that the last couple of years and the tree has come back each time. Um, and every year it's like, it almost looks like it, it almost has like no canopy. And then it receives these little injections for the brown tail moths and then, you know, they go which is not a popular, it's not always a popular thing to do. I'm aware of that, sure. but it's sort of like one of those heritage trees. So I guess, um, what's the, uh, I, I guess like, what is the, what is the ultimate like risk of that for the surrounding trees? Like if the, if the fruit is falling and it's, and it's like around and it's going to the ground. Right, so tree injection, is a cool technology uh ish i would not eat the fruit from a tree that has been injected i probably wouldn't put that in my main compost pile i would probably make a separate compost pile and use that just for ornamentals mm -hmm. um but it's like i said it's cool technology a lot of those insecticide products that the systemic insecticide products they're uh they're just they're concentrated minerals i think it's like there's one that's like phosphoric acid they're not nearly as toxic as some of the like conventional chemicals that get sprayed on fruit that ends up in the grocery store um but so i have heard about people trying injections for brown tail. I just personally don't have any firsthand experience with that. But if you've had that service done more than once and the tree is still being, being defoliated, it sounds like whatever the injection is, is not the appropriate product to target those brown tails and maybe a different kind of insecticide. Or, and I, I think injections, like I said, it's a relatively new technology. It's good because there's no risk of drift so it's isolated so the chance of like uh monarch butterfly caterpillars or other beneficial uh butterflies and moths getting affected by that is you know that takes that out of the equation you still have to uh spraying when you're doing aerial spray on a canopy you can if you spray the right product at the right time you can be pretty sure that that is going to control the brown tail moth problem. Uh, certain pro certain properties are better candidates for that, just based on the site conditions and location. Um, but yeah, brown tail is a tough one because there's no, there's very few native predators that want to eat them. I've heard like maybe some blue jays will, uh, mm. and certain types of birds. So. I think that put, creating bird habitat, like bird, bird houses, bird nests, places where birds can come, they may be able to eat more of the caterpillars. Um, but yeah, in some cases, if it's a tree that's near your house or near your car or where your kids play, uh, more serious intervention may be required in order to control that problem. And Frankly, uh, I've had some people that just said, you know what, we're sick of having these horrible caterpillars around our house. Please just cut down our trees. It's really sad, but like we can't afford we can't afford to keep getting the rash and keep paying for the spray and keep paying for the pruning every year. So we'll plant something else instead that won't be uh, you know, a host for the brown tails. And Edgar, I just, I want to pedal back just a little bit. So the, the tree becomes almost entirely, if not like near fully uh, defoliated 
but then with when the injections come, it's it's effective. The the foliage grows back. Okay. The canopy grows back. Um, right. After after the fact, after that time in the summer, in the early summer, when they're when yeah. they're out and they're they're feeding on the on the fruit trees. Sure. So it's been it's been successful. It is expensive, but we've decided right. that one heritage tree. And like yeah. I said, it is far away enough from the water, um, and we obviously don't need the fruit. And yeah. uh, we could, we, we actually sort of try to like gather it up so that nothing is you know nothing in the area is eating it like little squirrels or anything like that. Total. Um, but it is it is we are happy to see the tree survive because of this. So. I just sort of wanted to ask your opinion about it and like yeah. the knowledge you had behind it, um, because it's it's probably much deeper than than mine ever will be. Yeah. So. Uh, and while we're on the topic of fruit tree pests, someone asked about apple borer. That one also I saw last spring was just uh, tearing trees up from the inside out. And they said this person in the comments said that they did try to uh stab it with a wire and uh spray neem oil and that's really the best that you can do for those things like you have to get down on your hands and knees and i use like an exacto knife and try to like excavate them and get them out of there and the neem oil definitely does have a beneficial effect on them uh, uh deterring them from coming back but then also what i would recommend so I, this uh, world of biodynamic farming is a little bit experimental, but I've done this and other folks in the organic orchard world do this, is making a biodynamic tree paste using a combination of clay and cow manure and blending that together in a bucket and then smearing it on the trunk of the tree where the borers were. And that can help the tree heal where the borers were. Um, but the other thing to to do so that's the biodynamic tree paste i also will paint newly planted trees with white paint white latex paint and neem oil and that both deters the borers and also if they are in there it helps you identify them sooner because you can see where they're drilling and pooping out frass on that white trunk canvas so that can help you save your trees because they will, the borers alone will kill a lot of trees. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Edgar. I don't see anybody raising their hand and I think you answered all of the questions in the chat box, which is awesome. Nice. I definitely learned a lot today. Um, and there were a lot of questions asked today by our um, guests that I would never even have known to ask. So thank you so much for everybody who tuned in and asked Edgar the awesome questions that you did. Uh, this video was recorded and we will have it up on the Island Heritage Trust website and the Blue Hill Heritage Trust website as well. And my wonderful colleague, Martha, is here to remind me that on Saturday, John Bunker will actually be joining us at Island Heritage Trust and he'll be doing some book signing, a little bit of talking and some Apple identifying for uh, the guests there. So that is at 2 p.m. at our office home base, Heritage House. We'd be happy to have you. And look on Blue Hill um, Heritage Trust website. Forgive me, Blue Hill, for not having more details, but I do know that their Apple celebration is going to be on the 18th of September. And we will share more information with that in the follow-up email. So thank you, Martha. Thank you, Edgar. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, this has been another Friends from the Field webinar. And tune in next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.